Let us resume the public worship of God as we sing to God's praise in Psalm 111. Psalm 111, from the beginning of the psalm down to verse 6. Praise ye the Lord with my whole heart. I will God's praise declare. Praise ye the Lord with my whole heart. I will God's praise declare. Where may I assembly draws the just and congregations are the words of the Lord are God are made up of all measure so We continue in worship and we acknowledge again, as we have done already today, that glory and majesty belongs to God alone. And yet we confess that we often forget that and that in reality we seek that glory for ourselves 
we are often wanting the attention to be upon ourselves when it should be upon the Lord. We pray that the attention of our hearts tonight would be directed and focused upon the Word, and that we would find ourselves closed in with the Lord and with His Word, and that we would find the Word of God speaking very personally to every one of us. We come with a confession of sin. We are lawbreakers and covenant breakers. Our only hope is the blood that was shed at Calvary. But what a hope that is for God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, making provision without the shedding of blood there is no remission. That is the testimony of God's word, that blood has been shed, a perfect sacrifice has been offered by a perfect priest. All is done well. Every requirement is satisfied, and the way is opened. The veil is rent because the way is opened into the presence of God. And we come with boldness in Christ's name and for Christ's sake. We present our pers persons and we present our petitions. We crave the leading and help of the Spirit, both in our act of worship just now and in our lives in our souls. We pray, Lord, that we would not be left to ourselves, but that we would have the Lord alongside us, and that all of us, like Josiah, would be seeking the Lord. We seek him once, but in a very real sense, we go on seeking him day by day, seeking his presence and his power, seeking his grace in heart and life, for without him, we can do nothing. We commit to thee again, Lord, our homes and our loved ones. We pray again for those who are unwell in the congregation, some no doubt joining us online in worship. We pray, Lord, for blessing and help where it is sorely needed. We pray for those who know bereavement, whose death has removed one who would worship here uh, from time to time in our midst as he was able. And uh, now he is gone. His place is empty and we see that and we need to learn from it. But soon enough our place will be empty as well. For here we have no continuing city. Remember his parents. Be very gracious to them in these days of great sorrow and be with them during the duties of this week, and grant that they may know what it is to be upheld by the Lord, getting through all of these things by God's help and God's grace. Be very near to them, and grant that in a very personal and powerful way they may know something of that grace eh, deep in their hearts and in their need. We pray for all with pressing needs, and there are many such. We pray, Lord, for uh, illness, be it in body or mind. We pray for our community, the many needs around us. The greatest need of all is the gospel, and how little thought there is of that gospel, even within our own community. We are thankful for the things we have as a community. We have many blessings. We have many things to be thankful for, but we long for a day of God's power, for we see the Lord's influence and presence being marginalized more and more, and people's thoughts less and less and less on the great things of the gospel. What a tragedy has befallen us. Our Lord, we pray that we would know reformation in our own hearts, and reviving power from the Holy Spirit. We are so dead, so careless, so full of formalism. We are so far away from being zealous, so far away from being aflame with the love of God. We are so far away from being filled with his, his power and a passion for his glory. 
O oh Lord, save us, we pray, from that cold deadness, that lukewarmness, of which thy word tells us is unacceptable with God himself. We pray, Lord, that that and every other sin would be under the blood tonight, that they would be covered by it, and that we would find shelter as poor sinners in a glorified Saviour, in a pierced Saviour, in a crucified Saviour, but in a Saviour who rose again. And in his rising, we find the hope of our justification, of our resurrection too, and of our ultimate glorification. May the voice of the gospel reach hearts that are untouched, unreached. May it reach those that are undecided. May it reach those who turn one way and then another and are unclear on spiritual things. May those who feel drawn in one way and yet eh, drawn by other things at the same time. That is often the way it is. But ah, we pray that that dynamic power of God's Spirit, that true effectual calling would work in hearts and lives and that we would see young, middle-aged and old gloriously saved, swept into the kingdom, transformed in heart and soul and made new creatures with a new song, the song, yeah, a song that sings of Christ and praises his name, that we would see and that they would discover that even a delight in the things of God would grow in their hearts, that they would love to be in the house of God, that they could not be here often enough, that they would love to sing the Psalms, that they love to hear the word read and preached, that there would be a love for the Lord himself behind it all, and something of the experience of the psalmist. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear, I, while I live, will call on him, who bowed to me his ear. We pray again, Lord, for the denomination, all our congregations, the work of the seminary, as it closes again for another academic year. We pray for the students and all that they have learned in the past year. Grant, Lord, that it would be a bedrock for future ministry. Remember our vacant congregations and be providing for them and be bringing people within our doors for we see the, the weakness in many ways and we pray that we would be both a rallying place for those who uh, have an interest in, in, in not only in reformed worship but in, 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 in that experimental and reverent worship which we believe is only right and proper. We pray Lord that there would be those who would have a desire in their heart for these things and that they would come and that they would help us and that we in turn would help them and that others would be brought in out of the world who have no idea of the, of, of the first things of the gospel but would have a concern in their soul about eternal life. We pray, Lord, for blessing then upon all the gatherings of God's people throughout uh, the nation and throughout the world on this Lord's Day. May it be a day when Christ is honoured a day when his word is preached with clarity and accompanied with power. May be a day when God's people are made glad and a day when the enemy of their soul is gravely disappointed. May be a day when souls are snatched as brands from the burning. To that end, we pray again for the mission work of our denomination. We have mentioned it individually already today. We think of it now collectively and the wider Christian mission of the church. We pray, Lord, that eh, the gospel would have free course and be glorified. We pray again for our nation, particularly in these days when eh, there will be a change of government in, in the coming weeks. We pray again, Lord, that in all of these things, the Lord's name would be honored and the Lord's cause glorified. We pray for the nations of the world. We have again prayed for areas of war and strife we have remembered the church persecuted and we echo all of these sentiments again grant lord that even as we move closer and closer to the second coming that evil may be thwarted and good may be promoted be with us now lead us guide us guard us for jesus sake amen <clears throat> Uh, 
Our scripture reading this evening is from the Gospel according to Luke, the scriptures of the New Testament, the Gospel <clears throat> according to Luke. And we're going to read from the beginning of the 18th chapter, chapter 18, reading from the beginning. Luke chapter 18 and from the beginning. To this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up, in other words, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. In other words, this judge was hopelessly corrupt, corrupt and woefully incompetent. And there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary, give me justice, in other words, give me help. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall God not avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And he spake this parable unto <coughs> certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Everything in his prayer is I and myself. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them, but when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no wise enter therein. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute to the poor, <clears throat> and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye and for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? They're, they're, they're astonished at what Jesus has said. So they say, Well, in that case, who's going to be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And we trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading <coughs> of his holy and an errant word. We turn to sing now in Psalm 119 and we're singing. 
verse 9 down to 16, the whole of this second part. We were reading there about a young man. Well, here's the question. By what means shall a young man learn his way to purify, if he according to thy word thereto attentive be? <clears throat> I would mean shall I friends, as we were considering one Old Testament king this morning, Josiah, I thought it prudent to leave our studies in Second Samuel, 
King David and Absalom's rebellion to one side, and indeed we'll be leaving it to one side now till at least after the communion. And to turn instead this evening to the passage that we read there, the Gospel according to Luke and chapter 18. The Gospel according to Luke and chapter 18, and we'll read again at verse 18. Luke 18 and at verse 18. The ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> the conversation between Jesus and this man here is recorded three times in the Gospels. You know, some things are recorded only once in the Gospels. Only one of the Gospels will refer to it. Other things perhaps are mentioned twice. There are a few things that are mentioned thrice, and this is one of them. And in each Gospel account, we get additional detail that builds up for us into the overall picture. In Matthew's Gospel, we're told, for example, that he was a young man. Don't know how young, but he was a young man. Here in Luke's account, we're told that he was a ruler. We put all three together, and they tell us that he was rich. And so when we bring all the three together, we have the name by which he is very often known, the rich young ruler. Don't know his name, don't know his background. Some have speculated that it was the Apostle Paul in his unconverted days, but there's precious little evidence really to back that up. But we don't know, and it doesn't matter. Now, if we are spared in our studies, and I'm conscious that if we're spared in our studies, in Mark's Gospel on Sabbath mornings, we're going to meet Mark's account of this incident. It's there, um, a chapter or two ahead of us. But my intention this evening is not to cover the ground that if we're spared, we'll cover then, but to look at a slightly different, a different emphasis maybe on the passage. When we come to it in Luke's Gospel, I intend to go into some depth into the conversation that develops between Jesus and this man. My intention this evening is to take more of an overview of the whole event. I will refer to the conversation, but not perhaps in as much detail. Now, there are four things <clears throat> about this man that we learn from this passage. We learn, first of all, that he was concerned. He was concerned. That's what brings him to the Lord. He could have done any number of other things that day. No doubt he had other things to do that day. But whatever they were, they were set to one side because he has a concern. He had woken up that day, perhaps, with a concern. A concern, a niggling concern in his heart and soul. And he eventually makes his way to meet with the Lord to talk about this concern that he had, this spiritual concern that he had. Now, I don't know if you have a spiritual concern. Is, is there something niggling, perhaps, in your own heart, in your own mind as well? And maybe you're not sure who to go to or what to do about it. Well, ultimately, we saw this morning that we are to seek the Lord in, in his word, in prayer, in the preaching of the word, and so on. But sometimes it is good to go and speak to somebody and to talk things through. Well, he was certainly wanting to talk about it. He comes to Jesus in verse 18, <clears throat> and he says to him, Good master, and I'm not going to go into that part of it tonight, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do? 
I am conscious, he says, that perhaps there is something that I need to do. He is seeking. We were speaking this morning about seeking. This man is seeking. He's seeking the truth. He's not content with anything other than the truth, it appears at least when we first meet him. He appears to be seeking the truth. He appears to be looking for an answer to the most important issue of all, the whole matter of eternal life. He is concerned about his soul and how it will be with his soul when he dies and where he will be when death catches up with him. Now, as a, a rich young man, he probably had many distractions. He probably had access, just as Josiah that we were looking at today had in his life as well. But he's not distracted by these things. At least it appears initially that he is not distracted by these things. We'll see as we go on just where the fault lines are. But he appears that uh, as though these things are, are not distracting him as a ruler of some sort we're not entirely sure what sort of ruler he was he was probably very busy but such is his concern that he puts all of these things to one side in order to meet with the lord and to raise this issue with him such is his concern he is concerned he is concerned about his soul He is concerned about his eternal destiny. He wakes up and this weighs on his mind. What can I do that I may inherit eternal life? He was concerned. And we're told in Mark's gospel that he was so concerned that not only did he come to Jesus, do you remember what Mark tells us? He came running to Jesus. It appears as though he can't get there fast enough. What a good sign. It all looks so hopeful when we first meet him. He's running to the Lord. Quite literally running to the Lord. I wonder if you're running to the Lord. Running to the Bible, running to church, running for answers and guidance and the way of eternal life, running as the psalmist was running in the verse we just sang a moment ago with that great question, by what means shall a young man learn? Are you running? Or are you dragging your feet there? Are you dragging your feet there? He was concerned. Are you concerned? Concerned about your soul? My friend, you should be. I don't need to tell you that death has visited us. And that there's a pew empty here that will never be filled again. A young man who attended this church and was called into eternity this week, at the age of 49 years. These things should concern us. We live in an age when death doesn't seem to have any impact at all. That's probably because of the withdrawing of God's presence and spirit. It almost becomes something that doesn't speak to us or touch us. This is the most important question that any of us can ever ask. Look at verse 18. What shall I do? Let's just read these words in, in, in slow motion. What? What? Is there anything? What shall? I do what 
can I do? Where can I turn? He was concerned. But then we notice, secondly, that he was confused. He was confused. As we read the verses, <clears throat> it becomes very obvious that he is making a basic error. There is a fundamental problem in this man's thinking, in his understanding, in his spiritual outlook. And you don't have to go far into the incident to begin to suspect that that was the case. He is concerned about eternal life. But unfortunately, at the same time, he is confused about eternal life. Confused particularly about how he could get eternal life. And there's more than a hint of that in these opening words. What shall I do? Because he's viewing it as something that he himself is going to do. That it's something he could get through his own efforts. Jesus sees straight away the problem. You know, sometimes when you're speaking to people, <clears throat> you realize very quickly in a conversation that there is a basic misunderstanding. And before you begin to deal with anything that they're asking, sometimes you have to correct that misunderstanding and go to the very root of the problem. Well, that's exactly what the Lord is going to do here. Jesus sees, for all his eagerness, for all his running, for all his concern, that he is confused and that that confusion needs to be confronted and cleared up before an inch of progress can be made. And where's the confusion? Well, Jesus sees this man is relying on his own personal effort and his own personal goodness to get to heaven. That comes out clearly in the conversation that follows. And we will see as we begin to probe where he is, that such is his confusion that he is confident that he was blameless before God. Blameless before God. Now you can't get a more basic error than that one. If you've taken the wrong turn at that juncture, you've taken a seriously wrong turn. Now he wasn't unusual in that. And this in fact is why some people suggested was the Apostle Paul in his unconverted days because he speaks in the epistle to the Philippians about having exactly that same outlook before the Lord came into his life. He found himself and reckoned himself blameless before God. This man has no understanding that he has a sinful heart. doesn't come to the Lord desiring that the Lord would deal with his sinful heart. The man that we met earlier in the chapter, the publican in the temple, understood precisely that. Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. This fellow, for all his eagerness, has no grasp of that at all. No grasp of the barrier that stands between himself and eternal life. And the utter impossibility of ever inheriting eternal life unless until this problem is dealt with. He has no understanding of his sinful heart. No understanding, no thought of needing a savior who would bear his guilt and curse. 
no understanding that none of us keeps the law as God requires. And he has no understanding. How can I put it? He has no understanding that God measures goodness by the standard of God himself. <clears throat> I'll say that again. God measures goodness by the standard of God himself. That's the template. That's the mark. We judge goodness by our own standards. We and others are more or less, higher or lower, on the, on the, on the scale of goodness by our own standards. And we have all sorts of subtle ways of changing these standards. We compare, we contrast. I'm below that person and above that person. What nonsense. The standard isn't this person or that person. God's standard is God. God's standard is God. Oh, well, you come back to me and you say, in that case, he's demanding perfection. Precisely. Precisely. And once you grasp that, that changes everything. He was confused. By his own way of it, he seems to be almost there. Just a little more effort will get him over the line. What shall I do? What one thing is left? What more can I do in addition to all I've already done? But friends, the clear teaching of the Bible is that we do not inherit eternal life by our doing and our efforts. No one inherits eternal life because they are morally upright, because in the sight of God, none of us are morally upright. The Bible tells us that. There is none righteous and just just in case we try to squeeze in there, it adds no, not one. Not one. Well, there, there's not an inch there left for us. If it said not ten, we might say, well, it's nine or ten. If it said not, not, not five, well, it's three or four. No, what? Zero. Zero. And that's why the Bible brings us from that place to Christ. He comes into this world not to save righteous people, there are none anyway, but to save sinners, to take away their guilt to change them in heart and soul. The Bible speaks of it as being born again. Changed in such a way that we are transformed. A change so dramatic that the Bible calls it a new creation. A new creation. <clears throat> That's not a lick of paint, you know. That's not a bit of a dusting. That's demolition. That's rebuild. They come to know, to rely on the Lord, to serve the Lord, to love the Lord, to become his children by adoption. 
He was concerned, but he was confused. Are you confused? Are you clear on these things? Or, or, or did you lose me five minutes ago? He is concerned and he is confused. Thirdly, he is conceited. He is conceited. He had great confidence in his own ability. His own ability to meet the demands of God for eternal life. Now you wouldn't think initially that he was conceited. And maybe in, in ordinary things of life, maybe he wasn't particularly conceited. But he certainly was when it came to spiritual things. Jesus, you see, reads him so well. And what does the Lord do? He begins to list some of the Ten Commandments. He records, I think, five of them there in verse 22. Jesus says, what does the law of God say? And he gives them examples. And he says, oh, that's no problem. That's no problem. Verse 21. And he said, all these, all these have I kept from my youth up. Oh, he said, I, I've kept all of that since I was a child. That's, that's child's play. That's easy. I said earlier that he was confused. Well, here he is cons confused about the spiritual nature of God's law. He fails to grasp that God is not merely interested in our attitudes, in our, in our actions rather, and in our words, but with what lies in our hearts. There's no grasp of that. What does Jesus say in Matthew 5, verse 21? <clears throat> As he deals with this very thing. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Oh, well, I, I haven't killed anybody. Oh, hold on. I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, is in danger of judgment. You're not actually killed anyone. Well, that's good. Obviously, that's good. That doesn't mean to say that God judges you free of that command. Have you ever been unjustly angry? how we are in our heart to the law. You might covet something in your heart. You might not follow it through for all sorts of reasons. You're guilty of it before God. He thinks all he has to do is not kill anyone or physically commit adultery. And Jesus says, no, no. What about your motives, the thoughts in your heart, the things you've thought but never acted on? And that's before we even touch the other side of the issue. Our failure to, to do what the law requires.
He is conceited. It doesn't enter his head that he wouldn't inherit eternal life. As far as he's concerned, it's almost done. He's, he's almost there. And he is fairly confident he will get there. He felt so spiritually entitled. But what does Jesus say? Well, he says just one problem. Doesn't say it, but I think he was relieved. Oh, just one. Just one issue. We'll come to the one issue in a minute. All these I have kept since I was a child. Is that you? Is that your response? Do you think you're good enough to inherit eternal life? Well, he was concerned. He was confused. He was conceited. And he was confronted. He was confronted. Jesus confronts him with God's law. He's going to tackle his confusion. He's going to come head on at his conceit. He takes him first of all to the second table of the law that deals with our relationship with others. And as we saw, he lists five commandments and very glibly, very superficially, he skims over it. No problem, he says, for me at all. But then somewhat indirectly, Jesus takes him to the first table of the law that deals with our relationship with God. And he does it in a way that was full of surprise perhaps for us. He confronts him with something else. Another tester. How do you stand in relation to God's law, he said. Oh, he said, splendidly. Very well, says Jesus. Let's, let's just deal with one other thing. One thing you lack. Verse 22. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor. The Lord's ways are so different to ours, aren't they? I often think that if somebody had knocked on my door concerned about their soul and I'd taken them in I often think well is this how you would deal with it and perhaps it might not be but it's how the Lord deals with it he gets right to the root of the problem why does the Lord say this well he's obviously not telling him that the way to heaven is by works of charity. That is obviously not the Lord's message because that would contradict everything else in Scripture. If we go to heaven by works of charity, we don't need Christ and we don't need a cross and we don't need Calvary. We don't need any of that. He's not telling him that we are saved by the law. That by better zeal after the law, all will be well. He's testing him. You want eternal life, he said. Oh, yes. How much would you give for it? How much would you give for it? How much do you value it? Would you give up everything for it? Mm -hmm. 
I have kept the law since I was a child, he said. <clears throat> well, he said, I've listed some of the commandments. What about the first one? What about the first one? What's the first one? You will have no other gods before me. Let's see if you have any other gods before God. Let's just probe that one. He doesn't let him give a glib answer, but he probes him. Young ruler, you worship your money. He said, there are men around me here in the disciple company. I called them, and such was their concern to be with me that they left everything they had. Sell all that you have, and then come and see me. And as, as R.C. Sproul put it, then we'll talk about the second commandment, and we'll see how you're getting on with that one. It's too much. His heart belonged to this world. And he is confronted with that. And he walks away. He walks away. He looked so promising. Although alarm bells begin to ring very early in the conversation. And certainly when we hear his conceit, we become increasingly worried. But he looks so promising. His heart belonged to this world. Don't ask me to give up this world. I thought you wanted the next world. Oh, not that much. And the scene is played out again and again and again. In countless lives. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And this is a striking example of it. His heart belonged to this world. And to the things of this world. That was his God. That was the center of his life. That was the center of all that he had, all these possessions. You will have no other gods before me. You're going to follow me. It will take zeal, it will take commitment. I want your heart. Oh, he says, I can't give you that. I can't give you that. And he walks away. He was confronted. So he goes. Where's your heart? What's it set on? What shall I do? To go back to R.C. Sproul, he very perceptively points out it was the wrong question. What he should have asked Jesus is what will you do that I may inherit eternal life? What will you do as a saviour? That I, a poor sinner, may inherit eternal life. And Jesus would have said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take the burden of your sin. The curse and the shame. I will pay your debt. I will make peace and a way of peace between yourself and God. That's what I'll do. You'll do nothing. Because you can't do anything. 
I'll do everything. Because only I can do everything. What shall I do? No. What will you do? And you read on in Luke's gospel. And you'll find out what he would do. He would spare no pain. In order that his people, poor, broken sinner to trust in him, would inherit eternal life. Because it's all of grace. What shall you do? The answer is the cross. That's what he would do. And he would do it perfect. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He walks away. My friend, don't walk away. And remember what this passage is telling us. Eternal life is by God's grace and provision alone. It's not our righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. It's not our work, but his work. Not our doing, but his doing. It's trusting in him alone. As a saviour who dies for his people, who sheds his blood for his people. He makes a way of peace. Not by our efforts. At keeping the law that we can't even begin to keep. But he keeps the law for his people. He is the only person to, who could ever say. All these have I kept from my youth up. Jesus could answer that question honestly. How did he stand with the first commandment, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth? He kept them all from his youth up. He is holy, harmless, and undefiled. And his keeping of the law isn't just an individual keeping of the law by himself. He is the representative of his people. He keeps the law for them. So that God sees them in Christ as having kept the law. And in Christ, their breaking of the law is punished and pardoned on the cross. We begin with a ruler and we end up as we always do at Calvary. He is concerned, confused, Conceited, confronted. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, we pray that we too would be concerned, and that there would be a concern that would never really leave us, even when we find relief and help in Christ. And if we are confused, take away our confusion. If we are conceited, take away our conceit. If we need to be confronted, confronted with the law and confronted with the demands of God for perfection, confronted with our utter inability to do anything, then confront us and help us, O oh Lord, to change the question, to see that it is not what shall I do, but what shall Jesus do that I may inherit eternal life? Bless all that was done this day. Cover our sins now as we close. And go before us into the week. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalm 25, the, the, the second... Verse 
at verse 8. The Lord is good and gracious. He upright is also. He that for sinners will instruct. The meek and lowly he will guide. Sadly, the young man in the incident wasn't as meek and lowly as he appeared to be. The meek and lowly he will guide in judgment just always. To meek and poor afflicted ones, he'll clearly teach his way. The whole paths of the Lord our God are truth and mercy sure. To such as keep his covenant and testimonies pure. Now for thine own name's sake, O Lord, I humbly thee entreat. To pardon mine iniquity, for it is very great. That's what he should have come with. That prayer, pardon mine iniquity, because that's exactly what we saw in the previous incident with the publican. Pardon mine iniquity is very great. The Lord pardoned him. We're going to sing four verses then from 8 through 11. The Lord is good and gracious. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all, now and ever. Amen. Well, God willing, the prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, um, I have to be in Stafford that evening to attend to intermoderator business, and the Reverend Paul Flynn, who is still giving a period of supply there, will take the meeting in my absence. And I'll take, I'll take the meeting up there. Services next Lord's Day as usual. I expect to be here for these services. Remind you of the communion season a week on Thursday and the church cleaning a week on Tuesday. Uh, the only other thing I didn't mention in the morning, we had our AGM on Wednesday and there are spare copies of the accounts at the door for any household that as yet has not had a copy. If you haven't had a copy, um, then there should be some out at the door.
stone laid. <clears throat> well, all of these plans, of course, we leave in the providence 